uh, General Eric Smith, Assistant Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. We are waiting for everyone to sign on. So we are going to give a few minutes before we get started. And, um, and then, then we'll get right to it since so we only have an hour and uh, we'd like to respect general time. So if you can give us a couple of more minutes and we're gonna get started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, special session from our Voices from Japan with uh, General Eric Smith, Assistant Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. We're still waiting for people to sign on, so we will get uh, started at uh, 9.05. So if you can hang with us for two more minutes. Okay, I think um, it's nine five. So I think uh, we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get started again. Good morning for uh, for those of us uh, those of you who are joining on uh, joining us uh, from the United States, and good evening for those of you uh, who are joining us uh, uh, from uh, Japan and the other parts of Asia. Welcome to the uh, special session of a Voices from Japan uh, National Security Security Speaker Series. For those of you who are regulars, uh, you, you're used to uh, seeing uh, senior Japanese leaders um, to uh, hear about the uh, thoughts and their perspective on the alliance and the uh, Japanese defense policy. But today I decided to switch it up a little bit and get the uh, perspective from the other side of the Pacific. And we are extremely honored to have General Eric Smith, Assistant Commandant of the US Marine Corps to, to join us and share us the uh, perspective of the uh, how his thoughts on how the uh, 
Marine Force Design 2030 it, um, is, uh, is going and uh, how the current uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, might have had an, had an impact on uh, how, the, how you might do, uh, how the Marine Corps would uh, think further about the uh, future force design. As uh, General Smith really don't need too much um, too much of an introduction, but just very quickly, General Smith was commissioned to uh, United States Marine Corps in 19 1987. He had numerous combat assignments, and as a general officer, he commanded U.S. Marine Corps for uh, Force Corps U.S. Marine Corps Forces Southern Command, First Marine Division, and three Third Marine Expeditionary Unit Force and Marine Corps Combat Management Command of all the United States Marine Corps. And uh, his staff assignment as a general officer includes serving as the uh, director of the uh, Capability Development and Directorate, Combat Development and Integration, and senior military assistant to both to the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of Defense and Deputy Commandant for Combat Development and Integration. So welcome, General Smith. Thank you for joining us this morning. So let me get you started, Eric, with my first question. So as we all know, Force Design 2030 features China prominently as a U.S. strategic competitor and the uh, main country that uh, Marine Force uh, Marine Marine Corps needs to be uh, designing its force uh, force war as it moves forward. Would the uh, ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict impact the basic construct of the vision in any way, or would it just reinforce the vision articulated in the uh, Force Design 2030 as the future of Marine Corps? Uh, Yuki, first, uh, for, uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, ohayo gozaimasu to you uh, and uh, konbanwa to those who are joining from Japan. And uh, for, for those who, who are joining um, from Japan or really from anywhere, you, you really have no better advocate for this alliance than Yuki Tatsumi. Um, Yuki is incredibly uh, tenacious about uh, working to ensure that this alliance stays the strongest alliance that there is, I would argue, on the planet. And so uh, Yuki just came back from Tokyo this morning, maybe two hours ago. So she's uh, she has had no rest from that long 17 hour flight back. And so again, Yuki, thanks for the invitation and for what you do for the Stimson Center, but also for the alliance. Um, the, the, the question on, on Ukraine is, is fairly simple, I would argue that the national defense strategy, both 2018 and 2022 calls our pacing threat China or calls China our pacing threat. They are in fact, you know, the, the fastest runner. And, and unfortunately they're also having to be the fastest runner who is demonstrating malintent right now, um, declaring the Taiwan Straits as non-international waters, which is physically incorrect, legally incorrect and incorrect on every other level. Um, so with China as the pacing threat because of capabilities, but also intent, I would say that we, we cannot lose sight of the fact that our strategic interests lie in the Pacific period. Our strategic partnerships are in the Pacific. We are absolutely a NATO country and we have incredible relationships with our NATO partners and our European partners but our, our largest strategic uh, future lies in the Pacific. We, the US and Japan are both Pacific nations. Um, we, are, we are not visitors to the Pacific, we are a Pacific nation. Um, and so I, what I would say is as we, we watch uh, what is happening in the Ukraine and call out uh, what is naked aggression by Russia against the Ukrainians, for which they're paying a price. We'll continue to, to learn from this, uh, from this uh, war that was started by Russia for no reason and learn from it. But it doesn't shift the focus from China as our pacing threat. So some small things that we learn from watching the Ukraine is number one, the individual will of the, of the soldier or the Marine matters. So if you're a Japanese uh, self-defense force, a sailor, airman, marine uh, in the ARDB or a U.S. Marine, the individual training, character, will, competence of that individual soldier, that matters. And the Russians are finding that out the hard way, that the Ukrainians are willing to fight for something. 
as are we, the Americans and the Japanese, uh, our mutual defense treaty and our alliance. Um, the other thing is we're learning that uh, you, you don't want heavy armor on a battlefield uh, when it can be killed by drones uh, from much longer distances than the tanks uh, can be engaged. And I think also you're learning about long range fires. Long range fires are vital. And those things are part of force design, although force design is so much more than, than a couple of pieces of equipment. Um, the, the, when people will say that, well, you're, you, you probably should relook at force design uh, because of the Ukraine, I would say we should double down on force design because of the Ukraine, because it is reinforcing some messages. And then a final point, and I'll, I'll stop. The difference as you look at the, at the shifting uh, fortunes of war between Russia and Ukraine, the Ukraine has a population of 41 million. The United States has a population of 330 million. So anyone who gets an idea that, well, Ukraine may lose ground here or there, we're not Ukraine. Um, and us combined, the US-Japanese alliance with all of our other dozens of allies throughout the Indo-Pacific, yeah, we're not the Ukraine. And those who would attempt to take advantage uh, of any situation would be wise to remember that. Uh, you're on mute, Yuki. <laughs> thank you. I always forget that. Um, thank you very much for that thought. And I think uh, from what you said, I think what really jumps at me is the, uh, the uh, lesson that I really took from the Ukrainian conflict too, that it really is the Ukrainian people's uh, will to fight and uh, fight to defend their country. I think what really completely threw uh, Russians off that I think um, they thought that the, they're going to just roll over and let them do whatever. And it just did not turn out that and turn out that way. And once that basic premise was broken, I think um, everything kind of went sideways, I think for the Russians. But um, so then uh, based on what you have just shared with us, uh, how do you assess the uh, defense cooperation with the uh, Japan and the other allies in the uh, Indo-Pacific region? What if, um, specifically, I guess uh, we can, there's always a room for improvement, even if things are really good. So if you can share with us from what from your perspective, what are the remaining challenges to overcome or what are the things that, that together um, US and the allies in the region can do? Yeah, Yuki, great, great question. Here, here's what I would say. I, I will assess uh, two things. The US-Japan alliance, which is unique. It's a standalone alliance. Um, and then the broader allied alliance. Uh, we just held trilateral talks with South Korea, Japan, and the US. That, that alliance is vital, right? Um, and again, e easy for me to say as an American sitting here, not, uh, well, I, I am personally invested. My, my son just left Okinawa um, and I have uh, uh, cognizance, responsibility uh, in support of the commandant who has the ultimate responsibility for those Marines who are in Japan in Iwakuni and Okinawa. So I have a, a vested interest in making sure that our relationships regionally are as strong as they can be. I understand that the, the, the challenges with, the, uh, with that trilateral alliance between South Korea, Japan, and, and I read history and I understand it. But when you have a pacing threat like China, who again, does things like declares the Taiwan Straits as theirs, as they've done with the South China Sea, it is time for all of us to be as cooperative as our governments can be. Militarily, we, our, our alliance with the, with the, in our interoperability with the Japanese uh, self-defense force, it's as good as it has ever been. And it does get better every day. It gets better through Yamasakura. It gets better through Forest Light. Uh, it gets better through RIMPAC. I mean, it gets better when our aircraft are landing on the Izumo. It gets better when there's, uh, you know, General Yamazaki's vision of uh, Japanese self-defense force Ospreys flying wing to wing with U.S. Marine Corps Ospreys. That is a powerful symbol um, that the, the Southern Ryukus are well defended and are to, to be well defended by us, the Alliance. Um, so that, that relationship gets better every time we do uh, iron fist on the coast of the United States. I mean, we, we just get better every single time. Um, the challenges with, with this relationship uh, militarily are the same with any relationship, and that is interoperability of command and control. It's sharing of information, which is a lesson from the Ukraine. You know, we, the, the, the secret no foreign or secret no foreign 
has to be replaced by secret yes foreign, in the words of General Mattis. We, we have to share information more openly and more rapidly, which is one of the ways that uh, we were able to declassify things and, and demonstrate to people what Russia was about to do. And in fact, then they did. We have to do the same and are doing the same with Japan, but we can be better every day. And our interoperability for command control communications um, computers, we have to continue to be interoperable. Um, that is a real challenge when, when each government seeks to build and procure things using their own markets. That's fully understandable. A, a Japanese product by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, uh, who's sponsoring this, you know, the, producing phenomenal products. Boeing, producing phenomenal products in the United States. We just have to make sure that those requirements are mutual on, on both sides of the alliance. So we produce something uh, that can interoperate our computers and our command and control. Regionally, um, we have tremendous partners with the Australians, with the South Koreans, with the Philippines. Uh, we have to make sure that all of us can operate. Just a couple of years ago, we had Filipino Amtraks on a US ship and Japanese Amtraks on a Filipino ship. I mean, that, that, that is interoperable and it gets better every year. So I, I think there's, there's nothing but goodness on the horizon, but we do have to call out uh, naked aggression uh, as we've done in the, in, with Russia and Ukraine, but you gotta call it out when you see it happening, uh, which is what's happening in the Indo-Pacific for, for, for China when they say things like the Taiwan Straits are closed international traffic, uh, newsflash, no, they're not. Um, so we'll continue to fly, sail, and train everywhere the law allows, uh, as will our partners. Thank you. And um, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is going to be my last question to you, and then I will open it up to the uh, rest of uh, those, uh, those of us who are joining us uh, this morning. And uh, please do use a Q&A box to uh, type in your questions. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot, do, I cannot add, let you do the hand raise, but I cannot see with as many participants on the screen. I cannot keep track. So please do use the um, Q&A box to uh, type in your question. So last but not least, um, this may be a little bit um, sensitive. I'm cognizant that some of the retired uh, friends of um, friends of mine uh, who are also who have worn your uniform in the past um, before you um, are joining us this morning. But uh, since Force Design 2030 come out, came out, there has been some public pushback from the community of the uh, retired uh, US Marine Corps leaders. And how would you respond to their criticism? Mm -hmm. Or I guess the pushback, they're not really being criticizing, but I think they're having a pushback moment over here. Yeah. So if you can just um, share your thoughts quickly on that, and then I'll move on. Absolutely. Yeah, happy to do it. We, the, the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps leadership, I'll, I'll speak for myself, but I can tell you that General Berger, we, look, we welcome um, challenges. I mean, General Berger is a, is a certified planner. The first thing any planner does is question their own assumptions. You question your assumptions every day. And that's what we use our Marine Corps Warfighting Lab for. So we, we welcome the constructive uh, criticism. We welcome constructive ideas and alternatives. Um, we're, we are constantly checking our own homework. Uh, and we're doing that not just through the Warfighting Lab, but we're doing it through the fleet marine forces. Uh, our mm -hmm. 2nd Marine Division is currently, and all I can say on this open forum is they're operating in the U European uh, theater, uh, testing and using some of the force design concepts in the European theater to great effect. Uh, and they're, they're changing and tweaking those uh, on a daily basis. Um, so we do welcome the criticism. Um, frankly, anytime it turns uh, personal, um, that's, uh, Marines don't do that. I'll just leave that at that. We don't do that. We have one commandant. Uh, he's a Title Ten holder by our Constitution, and uh, you know, um, I signed up to defend the Constitution, uh, not the Marine Corps. I joined the Marine Corps to defend the Constitution. So we have one commandant who's our Title Ten holder. We have great support uh, here in the Department of the Navy and the Department of Defense, and of course, over on the Hill, there's been a couple of editorials uh, of late uh, to include a a dear member letter to appropriators saying, hey, you need to fund the Marine Corps force design and even faster uh, because it's evident that because those members have been briefed at a at beyond the unclassified level, we'll just say that. Um, and so again, I think the direction we're going is correct. We have to be part of a joint force. Our place within that joint force is absolutely critical. 
it's assured as long as we can be first to fight, which means you have to be light, lethal, mobile. You, otherwise, you're second in line waiting for strategic transportation. We can't do that. We have to sense and make sense on the battlefield. That's just as important as striking. Um, to say that it's not would be like saying um, a sniper's spotter doesn't matter or an artillery forward observer doesn't matter. And that's, of course, false on its face. So I would say uh, arguments uh, that provide constructive criticism are helpful. Arguments that just say, I don't like that are unhelpful uh, because I have to be prepared and our Marines that are on active duty have to be prepared, prepared to fight tonight. So we, we welcome the criticism. Um, um, but uh, one of the things the Marine Corps doesn't do is we, we don't take family disagreements out in public. That makes us unique. And, and I, I hope that uh, that doesn't continue. Um, difference between a, a, a forceful uh, academic dialogue about this works better than this, this better than that, that's fine. But what we don't do is, um, uh, is uh, cast aspersions on people's intent. That's not a, a Marine trait. Um, and uh, I'm certainly not gonna engage in that. So uh, I know we do have some, some retired folks, uh, retired general officers here, and hopefully General Gregson is on board. Uh, general Gregson is a tremendous friend of this center and this alliance. And, and I consider one of my mentors from when I was a Lieutenant Colonel and he was uh, a three-star and uh, you know, I was, wow. And now I'm a four-star and I still look at General Gregson and say, wow, because he is, uh, he is, uh, he is a wise man. So one, one to be listened to. And we do look forward to listening and continuing to listen to the, the dialogue from our retired officers. Uh, I just hosted several at my home uh, for a full day uh, classified briefing. Um, four stars, and it was, uh, I, I learned far more than I provided, I'll tell you that. So not, not uncomfortable talking about this at all, Yuki, it's, uh, it, it's in the news, so happy to talk about it. Hey, and Chip, hope you're hearing it. He is in the audience today. So. You're, you're allowed to call him Chip, I will call him General Gregson. So. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Um, we'll get right to the question. Um, we, we do have a people signing in. So first one is a very issue that uh, we have been discussing this morning, Taiwan. Uh, first question uh, comes from um, David Hessen. Um, so he has read about the uh, potential challenges in supporting Taiwan in a hypothetical uh, case, a case maybe not so hypothetical according to uh, Admiral Davidson and Ibaraki Elam, but and Chinese invasion of Taiwan. How would Force Design 2030 address the challenges of supplying the supplying Taiwan armed forces um, or providing intel as we have done in Ukraine? Yeah. So what I would, I would say uh, two things as far as supplying, I think the, the key uh, as, as a as a individual who at least I like to think I, I, I have strategic thoughts and I try to look uh, very long term. Th there's there's two issues on supplying Taiwan. One is at the true geopolitical strategic level, which is, is beyond the scope of the Marine Corps. And that is defense contracts, ensuring that uh, uh, that the articles needed for the defense of Taiwan are there before anything, uh, any, any hostilities begin, whether that's uh, missile systems, aircraft, et cetera. So that, that has to be supplied uh, as quickly as possible and uh, be on scene, on site before anything would start. Where force design um, really, really assists is in two ways. One, the sense and make sense of what is happening. Uh, around Taiwan, indications and warning that something is to is to, to happen, and to counter the the nefarious activities that could come with with an attack uh, on Taiwan, to demonstrate what is happening in real time, as opposed to the narrative that is being played out uh, or or posted. Um, it'll be a false narrative, but that narrative of, of why something's happening or what is happening. Those force design elements, long range uh, ISR platforms, such as the M29A uh, extended range, um, our expeditionary advanced space operations, which have long range uh, sensing capabilities and our Gator radars, long range fires capabilities. And all I'll say on this unclassified net is long range is longer than you think um, for our capabilities. It's significantly longer than, than one would think. And being able to, to be a contact force and also a blunt force to disrupt those early stages of, uh, of any attack on any ally in the region. You asked about Taiwan, um, but should, 
should that be a decision that's made? And we have a policy of strategic ambiguity that's been, been reiterated, but our ability to, to uh, reach out and uh, lethally strike anyone who would attack allies, partners, um, if directed by a national command authority is strong and growing. And then the final point is, um, you know, it's a concept of horizontal escalation, but uh, because any adversary would choose to focus on this piece of property um, doesn't prevent things from happening globally. So the Marine Corps is still a global response force. We're in the European theater now, we're in Central Command now, obviously we're in the Indo-Pacific now. Uh, we're actually working a little bit in Southcom. But our ability to challenge any, any nation globally remains and nothing is free. So if an action is taken in one part of the world, there will be repercussions globally. And our ability to, to take our Expeditionary Advanced Base Operations Forces, which are low signature, highly mobile, long range, lethal, able to sense, make sense, and then counter uh, bad information operations. We can do that globally and impose costs globally. And the last piece, and I'll stop. Uh, operations in the information environment, that is a weapon system. Combined arms is not just artillery and mortars and rockets. Combined arms is information operations. And I think anyone uh, who is keeping up with how information operations is playing out globally understands that, that is a weapon system along with cyber and space. It is a weapon system. And we have a pretty good capability there and it's growing. Thank you. And um, there has been, um, relating to that, uh, there has been, there, there are a couple of uh, specific questions focused on the uh, logistics that, uh, that are a vision in the Marine Force Design 2030 um, amongst the audience. So I'll go right, I'll, I'll attack, tackle that first. So first question is about how force design requires more logistics, like you said, logistical capabilities than the Marine Corps currently um, has organically or that the Navy is able to provide. So how will the Marine Corps incorporate forces in 2030 until those capabilities, um, logistical capabilities become available? Yeah, so great point. Um, one, logistics is the pacing challenge, right? Our, our pacing challenge. There's a pacing threat, and that's China. Our own pacing challenge is logistics. We don't have the logistics capability to, to work what we have now. And that's, that's the, the dirty secret nobody wants to talk about. Um, we, we cannot rely on big, heavy platforms to be loaded on strategic lift. And with 30 days notice, we can kind of waddle our way in uh, to support. We have to be lighter, uh, more mobile. So we can't do it now. Force design actually makes the problem less, not greater because it relies on lighter forces, more mobile forces, smaller units still capable of doing the, the job. Um, the way that you get after it is you pre-position that which you can using our allies and partners uh, to allow us to reposition. And frankly, you can reposition most things, but not lethality. You're gonna have to move your missile systems using organic systems, uh, organic US systems, which is why it is so important that uh, as the commandants testified, we need 31, uh, traditional amphibious ships, 10 big decks and 21 LPDs. That is part of our logistics hub, our internal logistics hub, when we cannot access military sea lift command because in operating inside the weapons engagement zone of an adversary, we can't bring those ships, which are, are by definition, not warships. We need our, our own organic capability. We have to ensure that our KC-130 fleet, that's KC-130Js, are, are robust. That's why we're going to add another squadron to the Pacific. We have to make sure that we have the appropriate amount of CH-53Ks and MB-22s. We also have to use uh, pre-positioning again with our allies and partners. And that's the thing that we seek with our, with our friends to allow us to, to pre-position uh, those things, especially non-lethal uh, supplies, etc. And this will include additive manufacturing. When you put in the additive manufacturing platforms along with metal, for example, that can be used for high-end parts for things up to and including F-35Bs uh, for engines, for, uh, for our uh, advanced reconnaissance vehicles. That takes a huge logistics burden off that last tactical thousand miles from the second island chain to the first island chain. Um, the, other, the final piece, the way you get after it is you have to reorganize uh, the logistics battalions. And we're doing that. We still will have 18 
uh, combat logistics battalions, but they, they have to be organized in a manner to, to deal with small 80 to 100 uh, Marine units who are strategically placed, not, not flung out there, as, as some will argue. They are strategically placed in order to facilitate fleet and joint maneuver. They have to be able to, uh, to support those disaggregated units. And then finally, those disaggregated units have to need less. Uh, we get a little pushback on this. Uh, it's called expeditionary foraging. Um, expeditionary foraging is real. It's what we do today. When we go to the Philippines, we have a contracting officer for a, for a large exercise like uh, Balakatan. That contracting officer pays a Filipino uh, citizen for the use of a vehicle, for food, for water. We do that now. Why would we not do that in conflict? We will be in competition with an adversary for those same assets. Um, but first you contract it if you can, and then you utilize it, um, uh, those assets that, are, that exist within any nation um, before you bring it yourself. I mean, that's standard infantry business. Uh, you, you shoot someone else's uh, uh, fire support before you shoot your own. Uh, the, the grunts on this net will know I'm not shooting my, my 60 millimeter mortars until I've shot the 81s from battalion. And battalion won't shoot their 81s until they've shot the 155 artillery or in, in our new case, the high Mars artillery. So expeditionary foraging doesn't mean we're out there with a the tin cup asking for handouts. That's, we, we do it now with contracting officers. officers. And one of the things we're, we're working to do is place those contracting officers forward uh, with those units who can contract for gravel, trucks, petroleum, all those things that the more I procure locally, the less I have to bring. That doesn't ex excuse the fact that we still need uh, Army Logistics Command and Navy Logistics and our own organic to support uh, those forces. But we have to blunt in the first few days. And so, yes, we take risk to do that. But we have to blunt in the first few days. We can't build iron mountains anymore. Those days have ended against the pacing threat. That's a long answer, but that's a, that is a wicked problem. And I'm glad it was teed up early. Yes, and then also that is the official problem that Japanese, your Japanese friends are uh, battling with too, um, as uh, General Yamazaki moves forward with his vision. It, it is, but I will tell you this, there's uh, the, the, the first island chain, having, having our uh, being allowed to have our bases in Japan, to work in the Southern Ryukus, to work uh, in the home islands, um, uh, the home islands of Japan, all of them, is hugely beneficial because it, it causes an adversary to question, to, are, you, are you ready to expand this aggressive action to include our allies and partners? Because people shouldn't forget, we have five mutual defense treaties uh, in the Pacific and the U.S. intends to honor all five. So that's, uh, that is something that I hope gives pause to those who would conduct nefarious behaviors because we have a mutual defense treaty with Japan and we will defend it as Japan will defend me. Um, and that is a, that's a, like I said, that is a, that is a strong alliance um, built by, by shared hardship. Um, and we are, we are committed to it. Thanks, Eric. And uh, next question, um, adding on to the uh, logistical capability issue is um, our own uh, Chip Gregson. Um, so Chip, thanks for this question. So his question um, actually builds up on the uh, last question that I asked you. Can you speak, when it, when it comes to this uh, logistical support to widely distributed mobile forces and is indeed a challenge. So can you speak to the potential use of unmanned aircraft and ships in this task? Secondly, how's the light and light amphibious warship coming. Australia has some interesting craft that they developed for the uh, mining industry. So perhaps they could lend or lease some of those to, um, to us for experimentation or, or perhaps a technological cooperation or some kind of an industrial cooperation might be in, or might be in the future. Yeah. Uh, General Gregson, sir, always good to hear from you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll hit the second part first, the light amphibious warship. It's been pushed uh, into 25. We would like to pull it as far uh, left earlier as we can. We are committed to procuring up to 35, 31 light amphib or 31 traditional uh, uh, amphibious ships and up to 35 light amphibious warships to quickly distribute uh, the Marine Littoral Regiments uh, to their strategically uh, pre-designated locations. 
the Navy is also procuring a next generation logistics ship in order to do fast, smaller level logistics. I would like to see the light amphibious warship come sooner, as soon as humanly possible. The challenge with the, the light amphibious warship will always be um, protection versus um, cost. People will say, well, that ship uh, or a traditional uh, L-class ship is not survivable. That is a, uh, that's a poor argument. Survivability is not binary. This is survivable. This is not survivable. Uh, Marines and soldiers shouldn't leave the barracks because the enemy makes machine guns. That's a binary argument and, and it's false on its face. No aircraft should ever fly because the enemy has anti-aircraft missiles. Well, that, that's a false argument. A ship shouldn't sail because the enemy has anti-ship cruise missiles. Again, false argument. So the light amphibious warship uh, earlier is better. We're committed up to 35. In the interim, to your other point, sir, we have at least one and have an option for two more for a total of three um, surrogates, stern landing vessels. We've already done one. It'll be in the Pacific, uh, up with up to three, and I think we will do the three. We have the funding for it to do three to to use as surrogates for the light amphibious warship. So that while we're perfecting the hull form, we're experimenting and confirming the concept. So three of those in the Pacific is useful. We also are using other currently owned surrogates, ESBs, uh, EPS, which is our fast transport, like the Guam, which is uh, which is there in Japan. To, to utilize uh, as a surrogate for, even though it's not beachable, but a surrogate for uh, the future light amphibious warship. So that's the law. Um, the part about unmanned and unmanned aerial vehicles, we're experimenting heavily with that. We have some platforms that can be launched from manned platforms that are unmanned platforms launched from, from manned platforms. And General Wise, our head of aviation is focused on the, the next squadrons of uh, unmanned systems, in addition to our MQ-9 Alpha ISR platform, those systems may be logistical platforms. Um, I would also say, sir, that um, we have both air, surface, and subsurface uh, means to do resupply. And we are, and we say, people say experimenting, uh, sir, you know, we're not a couple of guys with a, with a whiteboard, and we are actually using products from some of our defense partners, testing, uh, right now, uh, testing those things in order to, to move uh, lethal means, missiles, munitions. That's what I'm focused, uh, and I know uh, Lieutenant General Banta, our head of logistics, is focused on moving. I don't, I don't want to keep moving water and food. That's a, th that is not a difficult thing to obtain in, in the Indo-Pacific. Lethality is. So we're looking at air, surface, and subsurface means. But in the, in the aviation part, we are absolutely committed to doing that. Um, at a scale big enough to move naval strike missiles, tomahawks. That is a wicked hard problem, sir, but we've been on that for three years now and have made some pretty good progress. So thanks for your question, General Gregson. Thank you. Um, next question, I think it is uh, somewhat related. So if you, you know, if for those of us uh, who are in this uh, US-Japan Alliance business long enough, um, Back in the 1980s, um, there was something called FSX dispute between the US and Japan over the uh, Japanese uh, Air Self Defense Force procuring the uh, next generation fighter. And Japanese, in that case, Japanese wanted to build their own fighter aircraft and at much higher cost, but America wanted the Japanese to buy US plan as, at a lower cost. Um, but part of that uh, was also the uh, US side's uh, reluctance of releasing some of the advanced technologies to, the, to Japan at that time. Um, is that kind of a disagreement still play play in today? I think uh, this is, uh, I'm asking you to wear a cap of when you were at the CDNI, when you were talking about, especially with your Japanese colleagues on AMFIB, um, AAWs and, and such. But um, so first first question, is that is that kind of a tension you, you're still seeing today? And secondly, um, Kishida government is carrying out changes uh, first introduced by Prime Minister Abe in terms of more proactive uh, security policy and more proactive defense posture. So if a conflict with China erupts over Taiwan, and we seem to be coming back to this, um, what can we reasonably effect, uh, expect um, from Japan in the way of support from um, in, in, the, uh, in the forms of the support? 
yeah um the, the first one first um there there are as long as there are independent nations there is always going to be um uh tension about who procures what um will, will one country release all of their secrets to every other country in, in any alliance whether it's five i or nato or the u.s japan alliance the answer is yes there's always going to be tension and no countries will never release everything um i mean i Countries do what's in their own best interest. And sometimes I think we just ought to just say that because it's true and everybody knows it. Um, but when we're selling the F-35B um, to Japan and we're able to interoperate, you're getting the F-35B and that's what we're flying. Um, and I'm, I'm excited that, uh, that Japan has chosen to procure that aircraft because when you're operating from small islands, uh, let's just say the Southern Ryukus, uh, and you're operating through the first island chain, mm. and the F-35B with a vertical takeoff capability to move after a runway has been cratered, that is a good thing. We're exchanging parts. We're exchanging tactics, techniques, procedures. That's the F-35B. Um, so I, I think the any tension uh, is is pretty minimal um, in that that's the F-35. I mean, it's operated off the Izumo. Um, so I don't, uh, and, and one day may operate off the Kaga. I don't, uh, I don't really put much in that. Our HIMARS, your HIMARS, same thing. We can swap systems. Uh, ARDB, U.S. Marines, uh, not a lot of, you may have a slightly different radio as long as there's a connector and we can talk. Uh, it's, it's about moving data, not about what radio is on your back. So I, I don't, worry terribly about that, to be honest with you. There will always be uh, administration or industry uh, uh, proprietary issues to be worked through. But for someone uh, like uh, General Yamazaki uh, or, or, or General Berger, we're going to work through that. That's, that's, that's not a challenge, I, I don't believe. Your second part uh, about the defense posture, you know, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't speak for uh, for Secretary Austin or for, uh, or, or the president or for uh, uh, Minister Kishida, I, I would just say that the mutual defense aspect, th this won't be a case of uh, US or Japanese aggression. This will be about US and Japan responding to aggression from another country that spills out and hurts us and impacts us. Because that mutual defense treaty means if there is a spilling of something and it hits the southern ryukus we will respond uh we have a we have a promise and a commitment and the western army uh has no better friend than three meth um, i will tell you that and if you're on yanaguni um you have no better friend than three meth and three meth has no better friend than the western army in yanaguni or the ardb or General Yamazaki. That defense treaty is, you know, we always use words cornerstone ironclad. That defense treaty is inviolable. And people should remember that because aggression, as we've seen in Ukraine, has unintended consequences and tends to spill out beyond where it was intended to go. People should be mindful of that because that defense treaty with Japan, inviolable. And uh, there's, uh, there's, you know, give or take uh, 17 or so thousand U.S. Marines and 3MF, uh, along with their counterparts uh, in the 15th Brigade at Naha and the RDB, and uh, they are ready to fight. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, next question is the uh, role that uh, role that the uh, Marsuk plays in the. Um, in the uh, Indo-Pacific. So in Afghanistan, MARSOC and uh, US, uh, US, uh, US Army SOC had, uh, had split the responsibility kind of geographically um, and or soft pack. Do you see a stronger participation by MARSOC in the various training exercise and focus on certain geographic areas shared with uh, Army side? Um, I think that is. So I, I just talked to uh, Jim Glenn, who just left uh, MARSOC, Major General Glenn, and now Major General Trollinger. Matt Trollinger is in charge of MARSOC. Um, I would say this, we, we work through SOC PAC, um, and SOC PAC ha has access to all of uh, 
SOCOM's forces, and that includes MARSOC. So um, MARSOC is experimenting and testing certain concepts for us, and they're a great experimentation test bed, and they are fully, fully committed and supportive of, of um, teaching us while, while we teach them. But I don't view them as separate and distinct. Um, they are all part of SOCOM. So SOC PAC, uh, the, the TSOC through whom we work, uh, has access to those forces and, and has and is using MARSOC forces in the Indo-Pacific. And we're very proud of them. Um, and we're, we're working with them now. But I, I will leave that to the, to the TSOC to determine who, uh, who they wish to use, which forces, all of whom are highly capable underneath uh, um, General Fenton. Um, and, um, you know, I think you just saw General Rich Clark is the, uh, is a SOCOM commander now. Brian Fenton, who's JSOC, has just been nominated to, to replace him as, uh, as SOCOM. Uh, you won't find two better people. Um, and if you're an adversary, you won't find two worse people um, to be an adversary of, because uh, Rich Clark and uh, Brian Fenton know what they're doing. And our MARSOC uh, team is happy and proud to participate in that. Thank you. And uh, next question, um, since uh, you entertained the uh, trips uh, question on the uh, current status of the uh, light amphibious, uh, yeah. amphibious shift, um, next question comes from uh, um, General Nicholson. Good morning, Larry. Great to see you. So if you would like to have an update on the uh, newly formed combat littoral regiments, how's that going? Yeah. Uh, Larry, uh, good to hear from you. I get to call Larry Larry uh, because I've, <laughs> I've seen him after he was blown up by a rocket in Iraq. Um, and about this close to being dead. Uh, and uh, for those on the net that don't know, General Nixon, a former uh, three MEF commander, um, uh, and like General Gregson, fully committed to this alliance. But uh, Lieutenant General Nicholson, um, after being literally this close to being killed by a 120 millimeter rocket, uh, very, very badly wounded, uh, September uh, 14th of 2004, by Christmas of 2004, uh, he was back in Iraq fighting again. Um, that, that is, we would call that tough as woodpecker lips. And the, there's no translation for that. Yumi, I don't know how to, how to do that, um, but that's uh, uh, hard as steel. So Larry, good, good to hear from you. And uh, we hope uh, you and Debbie are well. Um, the Latour Regiment, we formed 3rd Marine Latour Regiment. And I think the biggest thing to, to remind everyone of is we didn't build new units. We simply modified units we had. In the Pacific, we have 3rd Marine Regiment uh, in Hawaii, which has just been transformed into 3rd Marine Latour Regiment. We have 4th and 12th Marine Regiments currently on Okinawa, um, and those will be transformed, just changed, reorganized. But they're the same units, the 4th MLR and 12th MLR. Um, that unit is already exercised and will exercise uh, both in Valiant Shield uh, and in um, RIMPAC and, and other exercises across the Pacific with our Australian partners, our Korean partners, our Japanese partners. Um, what it brings to us using things like our TPS-80 Gator radar and our Nemesis, Navy Marine uh, Expeditionary Ship Interdiction System, which is uh, kind of think high Mars on steroids. Um, they already have some of those capabilities. Some will be introduced in 23. Um, They've got more mobility, they're, they're task organized. I think the key is they are task organized. They live in their assigned deployable units now. There's no, uh, they are task organized. So if people say, well, the Marine Corps has a, has a MAGTAF concept. Yes, we do. And we will task organize for the mission at hand. So you pull things from the shelf and put it into an organization to meet the threat. Well, we know what the threat is, it's China. And so we have organized now before the first shot is fired. They live in those deployable units ready to go tonight. They have the uh, TPS-80. Uh, they have Mattis systems, although we, we need work on our anti-air defense systems, which is coming. We just did a couple of successful tests out in the desert here that are gonna, gonna yield some pretty strong results. Um, the uh, Nemesis system will be on deck in 23, along with additional KC-130s to give them added organic mobility. So I think if you were to ask Colonel Brady, the CEO of 3rd MLR, he would tell you we're off and running with 3rd MLR and they're actually out now maneuvering, testing, experimenting and refining um, what, the, what the capabilities of that MLR are and the tactics, techniques and procedures they need to adjust in order to be truly ready to fight tonight. 
and that will expand then to the other two regiments, 4th and 12th, uh, so that they're most ready to respond tonight in very hard to find, light, lethal, mobile, sense, make sense organizations that enable the joint force. And that's the piece people forget. We are a, uh, a joint force enabler and we are enabled by the joint force. We support the fleet and the joint force and they support us. But it is a, a true, as you know, uh, Larry, it's a team fight there. And there's plenty of work to go around for the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps. So I would say the third MLR is going well. If uh, Colonel Brady were here, uh, I think he would say it's going exceedingly well because they're being used in incredibly important exercises such as RIMPAC and Valiant Shield. And I hope that answers your question, Larry. Thank you. Um, next question is the um, is regarding the uh, interoperability between Marine um, in Marine between Marine Force and um, the Allies um, Allies in, in the Indo Pacific. So, and as you know, with an Indo Pacific region, vast region, many many allies and partners. Like you said, five five treaty allies, but many more partners with a different level of um, capability amongst all of them. So what's the Marine, Marine Corps doing to build interoperability between U.S. allies across the board in the Indo-Pacific region when you have such a variety of the uh, arms, armed services that have a different degree of capacity and capability? Yeah, yeah. So I, that's actually an easy question. Um, everything from Coke North, um, Kulamawana, uh, down to uh, Cobra Gold, uh, all those exercises with our allies and partners, um, pitch black uh, down in Australia, we're, we're doing a few things. We're building resilience of individuals, which as we discussed at the very beginning of this is the most important thing. Are, are we enhancing and being enhanced by uh, a Thai Marine? Absolutely. Are we uh, enhancing and being, and I say Thai, I'm talking Thailand. Uh, let's make sure everybody's clear here. Um, we, because some, sometimes things will be lost in translation make sure that when we're operating with the Philmars, the Philippine Marine Corps, that we are enhancing them and being enhanced by them in jungle warfare. That's, that's where it starts at the individual soldier, Marine, sailor, uh, airman uh, level. And then when you don't have equipment that is interoperable, you learn to interoperate. And those are different things. And you use tactics, techniques, mm -hmm. procedures to overcome challenges between your radio and my radio, between the way that uh, your vehicle moves and the way my, my vehicle moves. They have different uh, mobility thresholds. Okay, as long as I know that going forward uh, through something like Balakatan, then I can, I can interoperate with you, even if those vehicles are not interoperable. But you have to do that every single year or twice a year in some cases, but you have to do that because the Marines, the soldiers, the airmen, they change. They do their enlistment and then they move on. So it's a new batch of soldiers. So sometimes I think, um, for most senior leaders who will say, well, I don't see, I don't see steady progress. We're right. You, you may not because it's a different set of players every single year. And so we do have to go back to basics, reaffirm our commitment to the individual soldier, sailor, airman, Marine and their capabilities. And then once you, you get that ground, uh, ground level, um, requirement capability nailed down, then you move. So you're not gonna see this meteoric rise uh, because again, people change every year. But if we go back and say that what's most important is the will to fight, um, that's much of what we do with our allies and partners. And that is not easy. That comes with language skills, that comes with cultural understanding, but it comes with basic marksmanship, it comes with basic leadership, it comes with first aid, um, all those things that we do each and every year in these, these major and important exercises, those cost money, they cost time, and you're not gonna see this meteoric rise in, in, uh, in capability. We already have pretty robust capability. We're trying to maintain it and you enhance it bit by bit. Thank you. We're, um, this uh, conversation is rapidly coming to a closure. We only have five minutes. Lot, that's unfortunate <laughs> that I could do this all day. Uh, I know, so I know we could. Particular topic force design, but with this particular partner, uh, Japan. Right, exactly. But um, maybe we'll carry that afterwards. But um, anyway, last question comes from the uh, NPR Soviet Bureau. So hardening and dispersal of military assets are sometimes described as a part of the response to missile threats. And you know, it's part of the very important part of the force protection and the force resiliency as well. 
So how are these efforts progressing in comparison to what forces then call for, especially on Okinawa? How to deal with the constraints like limited space and the need to limit the U.S. Mil you know, uh, keep the U.S. military footprint as small as you know, it can be or what the uh, two government um, has agreed upon? Yeah. So real quickly, and I'm going to I'm going to veer off the topic a little and come back. I promise. <laughs> OK, uh, look, I, the, the best duty station I ever had was Okinawa. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, my relationship uh, with uh, one with the government of Japan uh, and my friend. And he is my friend, General Yamazaki. Um, uh, no, no finer leader uh, available. Uh, and there are, there are so many other general officers uh, within and admirals within the Japanese self-defense force that I won't even start naming because we would consume the last five minutes. So I thoroughly enjoyed that relationship. I also enjoyed my relationship with the prefectural government of Okinawa with uh, Governor Tamaki. And I hope Tamaki-san is watching, uh, is a fan of the Stimson Center, because um, I think when, you, when, you, when you're fortunate to be a resident uh, of Okinawa, even if not a citizen, but I was a resident of Okinawa. Um, it's, it is a phenomenal place to live and the relationship is actually quite good down at the local level, whether it's in uh, Yomitan or Nago or Naha. The, the Marines love being there and we are committed to our, uh, our agreement to bring in the Marine force on Okinawa down to about 10,000. Uh, so we're, we're committed, we'll do that. Uh, the Japanese government has been incredibly helpful on, on Def, uh, defraying those costs for the United States to move those forces throughout the Pacific, uh, mostly to Guam and Hawaii. So, what I would say uh, on on Okinawa, when you when you when you harden things uh, in Japan, Okinawa, Guam, hardening is one thing. Dispersal is more important than hardening. I would also remind those who are perhaps not our friends who are watching that things like uh, Fatenma, and then ultimately the Fatenma replacement facility. Those are United Nations bases uh, as well. And they fly a UN flag. People should remember that. Uh, that's, that is a, uh, I won't say that's a shield, but that's something for adversaries to remember. That's not a US and a Japan base only. That is a United Nations base. Um, and it flies the UN flag. So uh, shout out and reminder to those who would do nefarious things uh, about those bases. So we need to harden them for multiple reasons need to harden them for environmental concerns. Obviously, we don't want anything spilling, fuel, uh, firefighting foam. That, that is, that's unacceptable to all of us. You harden them so that uh, if an attack comes against our ally, Japan, or against our ally, the Philippines, or our own territory, Guam, you can uh, absorb those initial attacks and then immediately respond. Ideally, you, re you respond simultaneously. The dispersal is more important. Um, I would say a light amphibious warship, or in, let's just take a helicopter carrier, an LHA, that moves about 450 to 500 miles a day. I mean, that is a difficult target to hit. It is certainly more difficult to hit than a stationary air base. So I think the dispersal of units, constantly having them out, constantly having them on the move, constantly having them disperse with other allies and partners, should should an adversary choose to strike them, you have immediately escalated to bring in multiple allies. And that is an unwise course of action because now you're not having a, a, a spat or a fight with the United States. You're having a, a, a fight with all of us who are here in those five mutual defense treaties. So hardening is very important. Underground fuel tanks, uh, revetments, bunkers, uh, resilient communications things, fiber optic cables, all those are, are very important for any base to include base uh, security, right? Meaning unauthorized drone flights, which are just incredibly dangerous. Uh, drones bumping into civilian and military aircraft is gonna cause deaths on the ground. Uh, that's why drones should never be flown over uh, any uh, US or Japanese base. Uh, I won't speak for the Japanese government, but a US base, you, you cannot fly a drone over the top, even if you want to, if you want a picture, just ask, we'll give you a picture, but don't, don't enter into airspace where you could collide with the military aircraft, which could then crash uh, in, in a place we don't want it to. Um, small reminder to those who are drone pilots, please uh, put that word out. That's, it's, 
it's, we're not hiding anything. We just don't want airplanes to bump. But when you, when you protect that base, fences, airspace, that is also part of resilience. And then uh, you focus on dispersal. You have to have those units not there, which also adds to the about 10,000. And the reason it's about 10,000 is because we have hundreds and often thousands of Marines who are assigned to Okinawa are always off the island, out with our allies and partners, uh, Thailand, Australia, the Philippines, and we wanna stay there. We wanna stay off of the island because in Korea, great training, but also makes it harder for an adversary to keep track of where we are at any given time. So hardening, important, constant, dispersal, more important. L long answer, I know we're, we're over by a minute, Yuki, but, but that's a really important one. And I did wanna uh, remind people of how much uh, how much the Marines really do enjoy um, uh, being privileged to, to be residents of Japan, both Iwakuni and Okinawa. Um, best duty station I've ever had and um, uh, would love to go back um, you know, as, as a pure tourist, uh, just to see the goodness that is uh, Kyoto, Tokyo, uh, and then obviously uh, Okinawa, Yanaguni. That's, uh, that is on my retirement list, probably first place I'm going when I retire. Um, and I'm, I'm going back to, to see my friends in Japan, uh, uh, throughout Japan, from, from the Ryukus up into uh, to Honshu. I think your sentiment as well really was shared with that chip and Larry and the uh, whoever who was in between um, about them, but they're on time in Okinawa, I'm pretty sure. And then I and I hope your son had a great time in Okinawa as well, although he was yes. there during the uh, COVID restrictions. So he actually asked, I feel I feel bad about that. He spent three years seeing his wife. He asked to extend. Uh, of course, the Marine Corps uh, said, hey, we, oh, we, we need you to go to recruiting duty. So he is uh, on recruiting duty in Texas, but he wanted to extend for another three years, despite mm. the, the lockdowns that all of us went through. Well, hopefully uh, he'll be able to return to Okinawa um, and uh, this time under less restriction with the uh, pandemic. And then he can really enjoy what you enjoyed. So that's the plan. That's the plan. That's the plan. Well, uh, this uh, hour quickly came to an end. Um, thank you, Eric, so much for joining us and uh, share thoughts. Um, very insightful, very helpful, and uh, very uh, appreciate your candor, despite that this is a public sentiment you know, in a public domain, uh, public information domain. I really, really appreciate that. And I uh, hope to uh, stay in touch and welcome you back next time, perhaps um, in, in some uh, in-person event, and that will be a lot more fun than uh, me seeing you across the, <laughs> across the, success, across the screen. Yuki-san, uh, thank you very much.